Windsor News at 8.30. In Toronto, it's 6 degrees with light rain. In Windsor, 10 degrees with mist. And in Thunder Bay, 2 degrees with light rain. Good morning. I'm Sarah McMillan. We begin with concerns about plans for a new long-term care facility in Pickering. As part of the effort to build more long-term care beds, the Ministry of Long-Term Care has been asking the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to issue Minister's Zoning Orders. The orders override municipal zoning bylaws, making it easier for operators to build. The latest ask is on behalf of Southbridge Care Homes. It intends to tear down Orchard Villa in Pickering and build a new facility. The home was subject to a scathing report in 2020 from the Canadian military for substandard practices that contributed to COVID-19 outbreaks. It also failed several inspections since. No decision has been made on the zoning order for the Pickering site. The city says it was notified of the application on Monday and given three days to provide comment. Council will be holding a special meeting next week to further discuss. A major environmental group is calling on the federal government to block Ontario's proposed Highway 413. The group says it would be too costly to taxpayers and too damaging to the environment. As Patrick Swan reports, advocates say they have the numbers to back that up. It's a colossal waste of money. That's what Gideon Foreman of the Davis Suzuki Foundation thinks of Highway 413. Ontario's proposed 52-kilometer stretch running through the Green Belt northwest of Toronto. He says building it would pump millions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere and endanger dozens of local species. Plus, we need to move people on public transit. We need to give people alternatives to the car. And he's not the only one. 50,000 people have signed a petition organized for the foundation. And they may have a case, says Executive Director Tim Gray of the Environmental Defense. There's federal species at risk, dozens of them, that would be impacted. He says the Environment Minister can determine whether a project can go ahead if its environmental impacts outweigh the benefits. CBC Toronto reached out to Ontario's government. They declined to answer our questions about the project. Meanwhile, Gray says Highway 407 would help reduce GTA congestion if the highway got rid of its tolls. Patrick Swan, CBC News, Toronto. The Executive Committee of the Assembly of First Nations is recommending the removal of its national chief. The committee passed a resolution yesterday asking for the removal of Roseanne Archibald at their next meeting. According to the resolution, an internal investigation into Archibald's conduct found a breach of the organization's harassment and whistleblower policy, as well as its code of conduct. The resolution was shared with CBC News, but the contents have not been verified. In a statement, Archibald said the executive committee is overstepping its authority. A Toronto tech entrepreneur with a new translation app will help people like you who want to better communicate with family and friends across languages. Joshua Gao doesn't speak the same first language as his parents, and he often longed for a way to communicate with them on a deeper level. The 24-year-old got a few of his friends together and they came up with Binko Chat, a free app that uses AI to translate messages in dozens of languages. I think the, the really exciting long-term implication for this is what, what does the world look like when there are no language barriers for collaboration? What does life look like when you can speak fluently with your parents, um, especially when you couldn't before? Because when, when, I, when I reflect on my, my own childhood, I see how a lot of situations are attributed to miscommunication with my parents. Gao says Bingo Chat launched at the beginning of the month and it already has more than 10,000 downloads. And that is your CBC News to 8.34. I'm Sarah McMillan. The forecast for Toronto, Hamilton, Niagara. Cloudy today with a chance of showers and a high of 13. Tonight, cloudy with a chance of showers and a low of 10. And tomorrow, cloudy with showers beginning near noon and a high of 10. And in Peterborough and Gwartha's rain today, 5 to 10 millimeters expected, a high of 10 degrees. Tonight, periods of rain mixed with drizzle overnight and a low of 8. Tomorrow, cloudy, rain heavy at times beginning near noon and a high of 12. This is CBC Radio 1 99.1 in Toronto. Thank you.
final half hour of fresh air for Saturday, April 29th. I'm your host, Ismaila Alpha. It is 8.35 for most of you and 7.35 for listeners in the far northwest of the province. Uh, coming up in this half hour of the show, uh, is there hope for the hardened criminal? Well, Phyllis Taylor says that there definitely is. She's the author of a new book about her experiences as a life coach inside of Ontario's prison system. Uh, she's going to tell us about her experiences working with thousands of inmates uh, in, 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 in uh, several different jails. So that conversation coming up in uh, a few minutes. But first, Omigaze is uh, touring the province right now. We're going to give you the details on where you can see them. But first, this is their brand new single featuring Peter uh, Dramanis of uh, uh, July Talk. This one's called Back At Me. years 
She worked in the prison system here in Ontario at five different prisons with inmates who are inside for the most serious crimes. Well, now she's released a book about her experiences called The Prison Lady, True Stories and Life Lessons from Behind Bars. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm really happy to have you with me here on the program. I'm wondering if you can uh, well tell us, what, what was it about the prisoners on Oprah that day that made you want to help them? What, what, was, the, what was the connection there? In order to understand that, you almost have to go back into a segment of my childhood. I had a very, very humble beginning. And for one year of my life, I was actually locked away. And so um, I had severe beating. I had been locked away. It was um, being locked away was in a basement bedroom that was barbed wired and, um, and boarded. So I don't know if that added to why I was intrigued by prisoners or perhaps gave me empathy. But when I went to the Oprah Life class uh, in Toronto, which came to Toronto, they had Skyped in six women from a prison in Indiana. And although Bishop T.D. Jakes was speaking and he is in all his glory, I was fixated on these women and I, I saw the light bulbs go off when they had an awakening. And in that moment, I too had an awakening. I thought, holy cow, that's what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I had just been terminated from the 30-year position at a major international law firm and really wondering what I would do with the rest of my life. Uh, now, I just want to back up a little bit here because uh, I don't think it's too big of a stretch to say that your experience as a uh, kid would have given you that connection to those women who were in prison. But just to be clear, you were locked up, not in prison. You were locked up in your parents' home, if I'm not mistaken, right? In the, yes, in the, in the basement, in the... I had been caught sneaking out the bedroom window, a very long story, of course everything in my life has a chapter, and uh, I had uh, crawled out the basement window, hitchhiked in the day, I'm dating myself here, and uh, when I was crawling back in the window, I was caught, and that's when I got severely beat it, beaten and locked in my bedroom, in my bedroom for a year. So fast forward years then, and, and you have this experience. Uh, 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 wait, well, on, on Oprah, you hear um, uh, about these 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 prisoners, and you immediately feel. Um, although it sounds like you couldn't put your your finger right on it on that first day, but you felt a connection to them. Well, you felt a connection to them. I've always been transfixed by marginalized, disenfranchised, and people who are suffering. I think it's the empathy thing, and I can't tell you that for sure, hmm. but I. I do really believe I have a lot of empathy and a lot of kind of moving towards kindness as a platform. And so when I it wasn't listening to them so much as actually watching them and they were so keen to, to change that I thought change is possible. Let's give these guys some help. I mean, I had, uh, as I say, I had been terminated and I had been paid out. So for the first time in my life, and there were reasons why I wanted to give back to society, which is a different path. But when I had the opportunity, because I was paid out by my former law firm, I saw it as an opportunity to, to be able to give back and do some volunteer work. So, was, so how did you start that? Where where did you first go to start with this work? I was so, I went to sleep, I got up the next morning, and I was so excited to go through Google and find every prison that I could possibly drive to in a 20 kilometer radius and call them. And it was a couple of weeks later that I got my first call back from a lovely lady by the name of Lori Shank who was then coordinating educational and uh, volunteer services at Metro East Detention Center. And that's where I was first brought in as a, as a volunteer. But of course, I had no idea what I was doing. I had uh, experience in public speaking. I've been public speaking and co public speaking competitor all my life, but I wasn't a motivational speaker. I wasn't sure about life lessons. I, I quickly learned all of that, and uh, that's how, I guess that's how my, my career began and uh, spanned over a decade. Wow. Tell me about that first day walking into a jail to work. What was that like for you? It's kind of a cross between surrealism and utopia. You know, it, it is going from a marble, beautiful, mirrored, posh law firm into a smelly jail, a prison. It's 
like really a, a juxtaposition. However, when it's something you wanted to do, and by that time I was so passionate and so determined uh, about making a difference, and, and never for a moment did I think that it was something I couldn't or wouldn't be able to do. When I got there, I was absolutely elated, and it felt like I was in a dream, almost like walking through a dream. And no matter what was going on and the adversity or the challenges, I was moving forward and this was going to happen. Mm. Well, what kind of prisoners did you did you work with there and in the other prison? So I've been in five Ontario prisons and I love to direct people to my experiences at the Ontario Correctional Institute in Brampton because it is a treatment-centric prison and the men in Brampton have to apply through their lawyers to get into that prison and in turn they get they get food good decent food they get education they get uh gym gymnastics outdoor activities to some extent and they get a, a couple of volunteers that come in and do the best they can as well and, and then so what, what do you actually do with them what, what types of conversations are you having with them tell me a bit more in in the brampton prison i'll just go to that one but you can ask about any of the prisons i visited and i work with both men and women and i worked in the general population which we call general pop and i've also worked in protective custody that in itself was quite an experience so as a, a journalist myself i would research a particular topic so for example forgiveness gratitude building a healthy relationship intentional happiness all of that stuff that we some of us know, some of us learn, some of us inherently learn through parenting, etc. I would research, I would prepare a little booklet for each of my lessons, and I would come in, and in that particular prison, and at the height of the population in that prison, because it varies from season to season, uh, I would have up to as many as 100 men in an auditorium, and I would deliver by either using PowerPoint presentation or just... Uh, a smaller group reading, as you would see in a workshop setting, I would deliver the lesson to them, and it was unbelievable the kind of attitude that I that I received from the gentlemen in that particular prison that I'm referring to. Well, unbelievable in what way? How did they react? They treated me as if I was a precious gem that somehow landed in their prison and it was the one thing that they were going to pay the strictest attention to and see if it was possible to get through to them uh i think they're thinking this to themselves because this lady might have something to say that might resonate with them that might make a difference that might turn them around and honestly i've seen it happen really tell me about that well, there's several stories uh, in my book about individual prisoners that I have uh, partied with. <laughs> That's not at all true. I have partnered with. <laughs> I have partnered with these individuals. One in particular just jumps out at me. In, in the book, I refer to him as Citizen Manny. And I refer to him as Citizen Manny, and I have full authority to talk about him, and I speak of him with enormous pride. This gentleman spent... 10 years in the Kingston Penitentiary twice. So 10 years times two, 20 years. He comes into the Ontario Correctional Institute and he meets me. Not only does he meet me, but he decides, or actually I think he was elected or uh, assigned to be my assistant. Every prison gave me an assistant. So that means set up chairs, set up equipment, give out pamphlets, take attendance. He also wanted to get to know me, and he had made a purpose of doing that. And so after he did all of his duties, he sat down right in front of me, front row, front seat, center. And when the session ended, he became my friend. It was that quick. He sat with me afterwards as we were tidying up and cleaning up, and he told me about his life. And he had told me about how he had watched his brother being shot in the bedroom by his dad. So rough stuff. Citizen Manny is also someone who I friended even beyond the prison gate. And when he left the prison, and I'm not really supposed to do this, but I'm one of those risk takers, for my own protection, I am not supposed to be in touch with prisoners after, after they leave the prison. But I did give him, I actually opened up an independent email account, not my personal account, another one. And I would communicate with him by email until I decided I was going to life coach him. And so I would leave the prison every Monday at 4 o'clock, and I would meet Manny in his neighborhood at 5. It was a glorious life coaching session. Eventually, he brought his
his wife to join us. Today, Citizen Manny is employing men who are former ex-cons and he is giving them a second chance and they do snow removal and painting and all that kind of stuff. And I couldn't be prouder of this man. I'm and bad. the error I may have made <laughs> by partnering with him beyond the prison gates. Wow. And so I, I find this so interesting. I mean, obviously they are, you can see that it is possible to rehabilitate a, a prison. So through what you saw at Ricardo, what's the key? What is the key to, to ensure rehabilitation and, 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 and the transition of what's leaving jail? So we're not going to talk about guarantee because there's never a guarantee. And even when I feel I'm getting through, there's a connection. And I, I've had it happen where I thought I really got through to a man and he was a heroin addict. He got out of prison on Monday and OD'd on Tuesday. A, a really heartbreaking story. But I can tell you that when you go into an establishment like this, in fact, any establishment whatsoever, if you deliver kindness, respect, humanity, and you have something to say that might make a difference for them, that's the formula. Mm. I had instant rapport with these men from the moment we said hello. It was an instant, a, just an instant connection. And I believe with all my heart, I've seen it make a difference. And I also believe I made connections. Uh, now you saw this difference uh, in this men's jail. You mentioned that you worked in women's jails as well. And, and uh, other situations. Was, was it, the response similar from other inmates? Similar, but very different. Uh, I did have uh, some women in the women's prison. I worked in Vanier Correctional in, uh, Center in Milton. And there's also Maplehurst Correctional Center in Milton on the same property. So with the women, I found them a little more difficult to deal with. Women are women, and I'm not being sexist here, but what I'm trying to say is they had a little bit of the competition stuff going on. They had a little bit of who are you. They had a little bit of I don't want to pay attention. And I even had a couple of them fondling one another front row center. And horrible situation for me. And I had to learn a lesson because I looked away. I just did not know how to handle it. Um, but nevertheless, there were still those women both in protective custody and general population who really wanted to learn. And whether they were going to get out of prison or not, they wanted to learn something that can get them through the rest of their life. So there were connections made. I just think it was a little more challenging. Were you ever scared when you were working in jails? Never, ever scared. Really? Honestly, honestly. I, I was in a room with, at the very height, men, door closed, guards are nowhere to be seen, and here I am with a gentleman. And there was one situation where a man attacked me. In 10 years, I had one man attack me. And the way it was handled by my friends, also known as inmates, they picked this gentleman up. Within seconds, they picked him up, carried him out into the hallway, and found, found them a, themselves a guard while five other men took me and escorted me to a chair because, of course, I was shaky. Hmm. And in that moment, which was early on in my, quote, career, in that moment I knew that I would forever be, I would forever be protected, respected, and just dealt with in the best possible way. I feel better in a prison than I do at the lunch table with <laughs> just the ladies. Friends, please forgive me. I love that you called it, quote, a career. You, you don't see this as just work, do you? You know what? It's a cross. It's a real hybrid between. I am someone who, when I do something, I do it up to 100%. And I don't have, I don't have an option. That's just how I do things. So how I ran my career in the law firm, I was a technical trainer. I taught lawyers and their support staff. And how I conducted myself there and how I did my uh, career there was exactly the same excellence and, and enthusiasm and joy that I brought to the prison. Did I see it as a career? Yeah. 
people like we all have our ideas of what life is like for people inside the jail, the inmates inside of the jail. We we all think we know what type of people are inmates inside of the jail, whether they be uh, uh, men or, or women. What would you want people to know about those who are inside of the jail, men or women, the inmates? I'm going to tell you what I want people to know, and that is Number one, these people are human too. These people have hearts that beat. These people need kindness. They need rehabilitation. They need respect. They need someone to come in and care. And if you are that person, then these people respond in kind. I also know that they're looking to change their lives around. And for the most part, and, and it's not, there's not one size fits all. There's all different kinds of hearts. There's all different kinds of language. There's all sizes and colors. And each one of them are different, but they do respond. They all respond to kindness and respect. And if you give that to anyone, not just prisoners, you will see something a little different. The six degrees of separation has to do with the womb you crawl out of. I mean, I had difficulties, I had a humble beginning, but I never had a beginning like Manny, who I described to you, in full living color. And I do believe that it's the parents and parenting and home situation that you've had that makes a lot of difference. I do believe that nurture is outweighing nature. Phyllis, it has been wonderful to meet and speak with you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. It has been an absolute pleasure. Phyllis Taylor, uh, the author of The Prison Lady, True Stories and Life Lessons from Behind Bars. She spent 10 years working with prisoners in Ontario's correctional system. It is 857 right now. Let's end with a golden boy. Here is April Wine with their 1972 hit, You Could Have Been a Lady.